And today's St. Thomas Aquinas' feast day, and something that I know, I mean, thanks, Thomas, um, for all you did um, for the church. Um, but something that he said is, you know, that repetition is the mother of learning. And the truth is, it is very true, and I think every speaker feels this way, that no matter what we can say, all we're really doing is, re is reminding and healing spiritual amnesia, which we all have. So I'm going to sum up like the whole point of today, which you already know, but it's important for us to hear again, is that each of us is loved, each of us is willed, each of us is necessary. I wrote that. No, Benedict XVI <laughs> did. Um, <laughs> But it is, he's right, uh, and, and we've been uniquely called, um, and we've been uniquely equipped for our mission, and that's why I love the Given Institute, because it keeps reminding women and galvanizing women to the fact of the, our infinite value and worth, the fact that we have been called and we've been given everything we need to fulfill, to fulfill this call. How many of you are note takers? Any note takers out? Perfect, I have three categories for you today, okay? <laughs> By the way, when I was talking to my mom about this talk, I, was, I went over the house and I said, I talk about my mom too much, but anyway, um, I'm Middle Eastern, it's like a thing. Um, and I was like, mom, right? Who's Middle Eastern out there, right? Okay, yeah, yes. Um, I was like, mom, can I just like, can I just like externally process like the extrovert I am, what I wanna say, because all the things I wanna say are so in my heart, let me just, can I just get it out? She's like, sure, 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 Habibi, sure. So uh, I get it out. And, I, and she's like, okay, it's, it's good. I go, great, I don't think I need notes. Okay, because it's all right here, mom. I'm just gonna get up there like Tony Robbins, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> she's like, no, honey, you need notes. Get it on paper. <laughs> so I put it on notes. Okay, three categories. The first category is dreams. Or, I'm sorry, desires. See, I, do, I need the notes already. Desires. <laughs> desires. That's the first category we're gonna talk about. Second category, dreams. Third category, the darkness. Ah, Sister Maria Goretti prepped it so perfectly. Okay, we have to talk about these things when we talk about recognizing the gifts you've been given, your desires, your dreams, and the darkness. Okay, let's jump into desires, okay? There are four powers of the human soul. In other words, there are four gifts we've been given in our humanity. Okay, uh, John Paul II in his letter to artists said that in a certain sense, although everybody is not called and has the gifts to be an artist in, the, in a specific way, uh, but in a certain sense, he says, we're all artists because we're all tasked with the, with the, uh, with the uh, commission to craft our lives. Okay, how, did, how then do we craft our lives? Well, the basic ingredients, the basic tools our humanity, the gifts we've been given in being human beings. The first and most powerful gift of our humanity that we have to recognize is our intellect, okay? Um, that is our desire for truth. We've been given this gift of this desire for the truth, and we've been given the capacity, the power to achieve truth, okay? That's the intellect. The beauty of this gift is that while we have this desire for truth, that also means there's something in us that's offended by lies. That's offended by lies. Okay, so to be able to recognize and then operate out of and cultivate the gift of the intellect, we have to cultivate the intellectual life. That has to be part of our task when it comes to our personal vocations, like who we're gonna become, what we're gonna do. Because the more we know, the more we understand, the more data we have, the more powerful we become. We know this, we know this already. Okay, so we don't just wanna have this gift of being able to think, which is a great gift, right? It's how we're made in the image and likeness of God. But we wanna be able to think well, okay? To think consistently well, to be in the habit of thinking well, of using this gift and this power well. When we're in the habit of thinking well, we have then taken this gift, taken this power, and we have transformed it and therefore transformed ourselves into prudent people. This is the virtue of prudence, okay? Here's a really fancy theological definition of prudence, okay? It's the firm and habitual disposition of this power, of the intellect, to discern 
the true good in every situation and the best way to attain it. So you know that movie Sherlock Holmes with like Robert Downey Jr. and he like goes into a room when he's like scanning it. You know the scene I'm talking, you know all the scenes where he's just like assessing everything. That's in a sense the virtue of prudence. Okay, I don't just know what's true. I know how to get to the truth in my life most successfully. Okay, so it's an internal GPS system. When you put your GPS on or you use your phone, it'll give you options, right? Here's the fastest way. Here's the way to avoid highways and tolls, right? Here's the way to avoid the street, you know, going through the streets or the crossway, right? It gives you these options for how to get there, avoiding accidents. So the better the data, the more rapidly you move. The quicker you get there, the more easily and efficiently and enjoyably you get there. Okay, so it, the, the virtue of prudence is like our internal GPS system. If we don't spend time feeding our intellect with the truth, the truth about ourselves, the truth about God, the truth about other people, about reality, then we're very severely handicapped in accomplishing the mission we've been given in this life. Okay, the resist, the, what I noticed the most about in women's, what I've noticed the most in women's ministry, and I, I, most of my life in ministry, which has been 20 years now, the last three has been in women's ministry, ministry specifically, there is this like resistance to cultivating the intellectual life. Like, oh, I don't know, that book's too hard. <sighs> but it's, 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 gotta, it's gotta hurt, right? When we go to the gym, you know what I mean? And I've got my five pounders, which is about where I max out. Um, it hurts. <laughs> I gotta pick it up and do it. Middle Eastern people were not athletes. Okay, so uh, <laughs> it has to hurt a little bit to refine the intellect so that we can become prudent people. So that we don't just fulfill that desire to know the truth and to get better at being offended by lies. But to, but to be able to think well, to be able to feed our internal GPS system. Okay, that's our first and most important gift of our human nature. This that we have to recognize, that we have to cultivate. The second is our freedom, which is our desire for goodness and our desire for love. So the intellect desires truth. Our freedom desires goodness, okay? Um, this is the gift that we want to give away the most, is our freedom. But St. Paul said, for freedom, Christ has set us free. And Jesus said, my sheep listen to my voice, and I know them. But we want to give this gift away. I know I do. That's why I'm always running my mom. Mom, what do I do? Right? Um, we know that we aren't supposed to follow the ways of the world. Like, everybody in here knows that. Like, you know. It's, it's dark and bad out there, we know that. But do we really wanna do the hard work of the gift that cultivating authentic freedom demands, right? And this is where the jury's out. This is where you can only answer that question for yourself. And I think part of the danger of being Christians and part of the danger of being Christian women and part of the danger of being Catholic, actually, uh, specifically, is that it's like, well, church, you tell me what to do. Um, spiritual director, you tell me what to do. Mom, you tell me what to do. Spiritual mom, and, and my spiritual mom is here somewhere, Katie Dawson, who you met this morning. She, you know, you tell me what to do. What do you think I should do? My friends, what do you think I should do? Catholic influencer, X, Y, Z on Instagram. What do you think I should do? You know, and then I'm going to spend time obsessing about myself and comparing to other Catholic women in the church, what I should be doing, what are they all doing? And that's fine. These are all helps. There helps, but no one can live your freedom for you. Your story is yours. Your circumstances are yours. Your, the details of your life are yours. The way the Holy Spirit shows up in the details of your life are yours. So we have to do the hard work of learning how to hear God's voice so that once we know what God's voice sounds like in our lives, we can consistently follow it. And then consistently following the voice of the shepherd is elevating the gift of freedom that we've already been given in our human nature to the virtue of justice. Then we become just people. And here's a fancy definition of justice. That's the habit of rendering another what he's due, right? Constantly, habitually choosing the good and consistently choosing the highest good, which is love in every situation. 
So the intellect discerns what's true, and then our freedom executes it into what's good. So we've been given the desire for truth, we've been given the desire for the good, uh, and the desire for love, and the gifts to attain them, to attain the truth, to attain the good, to attain love. And if we master those gifts, if we cultivate them, then we become prudent and we become just. We become free, truly free, not slaves to either the world's narrative, which, you know, when sister was saying, you know, we have to look at these scriptures, we have to internalize them, we have to keep repeating them to each other. That's because the world is loud, the world lies, and it, it, really good, it does a really good job of it, and the devil never sleeps, right? So we have to keep repeating it. We have to keep feeding our intellect. Um, you know, it, it, so there's the world that's lying, there's the devil that's lying, there's our circumstances that really are so good at promoting victimhood mentality, um, but we don't have to stay mediocre. You know, we don't, have to, we don't have to stay mediocre, we don't have to look around at what everybody else is doing. If looking around at what everybody else is doing is keeping us boxed in, if looking around at what everyone else is doing is inspiring you, go for it. But if you're looking around trying to become like everybody else, it is exactly the opposite of what Given's all about. It is about stepping into your original presence, into your personal vocation, and doing something new, because you're something new in the world and in the church. Um, so your gifts are your gifts, your freedom is yours, um, and your personal vocation is yours. I mean, imagine, like, I mean, the, the best examples are obviously the saints, right? Like Mother Teresa was like, who else is serving the poorest of the poor? We didn't even have that concept, not really, not in modernity, until her. It was totally new. It's not like she had, she had the little sisters of the poor. She went to go train with them, which is amazing, right? That's the body of Christ. But then she went off and got inspired by them and then did something new that, that, that the world had never seen before. So we have to just be really careful as Christian women to not give away this gift um, by, by comparison culture. Take hold of it uh, if you want it because it's yours and it's why it's for freedom Christ to set us free. Okay, so those are the first two primary gifts. And then we have two other gifts, but I'm gonna lump them into one because the two other gifts of our human nature is our emotions, is our feelings, okay? Uh, which is our desire for beauty and our, our desire for joy, okay? So um, I don't know how you feel about it, but I don't really feel like my feelings are gifts a lot of the time. <laughs> um, because our emotions are gifts insofar as they support what my intellect and what my will, what my reason has already decided is true and good. But uh, it's a battle, correct, um, with the gift of our emotions because oftentimes what I find, you know, not speaking personally, but theoretically, um, my emotions tend to boss me around, okay? Um, and, and, you know, this is very relatable, St. Paul. I don't do what I want to do, and I do what I hate. Why? Um, or, so the emotions are either bossing me around. They're supposed to be a gift, but they boss me around. Or, because they're so bossy, what I try to do with the emotions is stick an apple in their mouth, tie it up, and put it in the closet, right? Um, and then what happens? Suppression of emotions is a denial of our human nature. Big no-no because we're body and soul composites, so they're part of it. And then we get sick. And women are sick. We're very sick. Um, I think one in three women, this could be fake news, but I think this is true, have chronic illness. Um, it's re women get more, for sure, women are more sick than men. For sure, women are, get more chronically ill than men. Why? Why? So suppressing or denying emotions, it traumatizes us. And it causes, it causes us to get sick. I don't know how, how many of you are Gabor Mate fans. Anybody a Gabor Mate fan? Anybody listen to him? Yeah, great guy. Okay, he talks about this a lot. And I love listening to him and having John Paul II in my mind. Because everything that he says coming from the standpoint of trauma, of our physiology, uh, it's unbelievable how much it's aligned with what John Paul II says about women and about how the masculine needs to support the feminine. That's a like fun tangent I won't go on, but he, you know, it's, 
The point being that you know, we don't need to deny our emotions, we just need to put them in the proper place because they are gifts and they are gifts designed to support our missions, not to um, discern or decide or run our lives, not to boss us around and not to be stuffed into a corner, but to be our, the supporting actors um, in terms of what reason is dictating. Okay, so they're not the boss. You know, the, 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 um, our intellect is the boss. That's why the philosophers call the intellect and the virtue that perfects it prudence, the charioteer of all the virtues. Okay, but the emotions are very powerful. So if we don't pay attention to them, they will either make us sick or they'll boss us around and we won't be free. So emotions that are felt properly, that are put in its proper place and that are properly felt consistently are gifts that then become the virtues of courage and they become the virtues of temperance. What's temperance? You habitually enjoy what is meant to be enjoyed without making pleasure your ultimate aim, your goal, your God, or your idol. That must be nice. I'm sure I'll get there one day. <laughs> and then what is courage? And we need courage. We need courage to be ourselves. We need courage to recognize our gifts. We definitely need courage to cultivate our gifts, and we need courage to fulfill our missions. You know, courage to accept your mission. The courage to say no to bad things, sure, we all know that. Uh, but it takes even more courage, and this is where the stakes are high, and this is where life is short. To say no to all the good things that are before you. To say yes to who you really are, and to the thing that you ought to say yes to, the thing that God is calling you to. It takes a lot of courage, because it means not being a codependent people pleaser. How many of you struggle with that? Right. <laughs> it's real. But when we get there, and I love what Sister said about St. <laughs> Teresa being 39. It's so consoling. <laughs> it takes a long time to get to that point where you've reached your breaking point and you say, enough is enough. I'm going to start being myself. I'm going to start saying yes to the thing I know I'm supposed to say yes to. Because if I don't, just like Sister said, the glory that God intends to manifest through you will be compromised. And he intends a lot of glory to be manifested through your yes. So how do you know you're manifesting the glory that only you can carry? Because guess what? The world loves codependent people pleasers, especially in the church with women. Right? How many burnt out, bitter women are in the church and parishes? <laughs> and we keep going, you are amazing. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm really unhappy. Okay, so <laughs> we got to be there for each other, guys. <laughs> okay, how do you know that you're manifesting the glory? Well, you're joyful, right? You're joyful. You experience joy. Your emotions are joyful, right? I mean, if St. Lawrence could be burned alive in the early church and tell his persecutors, I'm roasted on this side, turn me over, we can do it, okay? We can do it. We can get there, okay? The virtuous person, the, virtue, the truly virtuous person is the person who's not only consistently in the habit of discerning well and choosing well, but they enjoy it. The truth and the good, the true and the good bring them joy. It makes them happy, okay? Jesus says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete, okay? So the intellect, the will, the emotions, the true, the good, the beautiful, the joyful, all these powers, all these desires, all these gifts, they don't only have to be recognized, they have to be cultivated for the sake of your personal vocation and your mission. That is your craft. You are your craft. That's part one, desire. Got it? Ready for two? Okay, dreams. Okay, so we desire these things, uh, but we also have very specific desires in the form of our dreams. And dreams are gifts too, and those dreams need to be recognized. Uh, and you might be asking yourself, you know, where do I even begin with dreams? You know, if you're wondering this, where do I even begin with my dreams? 
um, you know, I, and I love what sister said too. See, I told, I knew Holy Spirit told me she was going to steal my talk. Okay. Um, <laughs> your childhood, your little girl, what, what were your dreams when you were a child? Jesus says the kingdom of heaven belongs to children. What did you do in your early years that excited you, that brought you joy, and that felt like you? It felt like you. What early dreams and desires have you let adulthood bury? And is now the time to uncover it? And perhaps, actually, many of you probably already know your dreams, but they feel less like gifts. Um, and clues to your, towards your mission, and they just feel overwhelming, you know? Um, but, but there's something in you that can't let go, no matter how overwhelmed you are with those dreams. And I wanna tell you today, please, please don't let go. Just learn to navigate the overwhelm. And I say to you, please look at reality, look at what you're actually spending your time on. And this is actually something I learned from my mom because I'm always complaining to her about my unfulfilled dreams, right? And, and she said, look, if you really wanted it, wouldn't you be doing it? If you really wanted it, wouldn't you be doing it? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so you need to have a reality check with yourself. Either you've buried the dreams and need to return to your childhood to uncover it, to uncover what's really going on, or you've embraced, and this is why, again, when sister said, like, please pray, because I feel like all, t all church talks are really just, please pray. <laughs> I'm going to do that one day when I do a talk. I'm just going to come over here and say, please pray, leave. Okay. <laughs> you know, so either, either, you, <laughs> either you need to just go back to your childhood, go back to humility, Go back to the Lord and just say, okay, Lord, you love me, delight in me. What is it that you'd have me do? What is it, who is it that you've made me to be? Or you've embraced a very profound form of skepticism parading around as faith. Ah, oh, it's just not God's will. I'm just so holy, I'm gonna let it go. You know, if he wanted it, he would have made it happen by now. I mean, don't blame God, you know, Simone. Um, <laughs> Right, C.S. Lewis says that for broken dreams, the cure is to dream again and to dream deeper. Jesus told Simon Peter, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. The objection might be, what if the dream doesn't get fulfilled in the way I imagine? Well, I have two things to say to that. What if it does? What if it does? And the second is, don't let go. Hold on and go deep anyway, because the authentic, godly, brave desire that resides within the dream will get fulfilled because God planted it there in the first place. He gave you that dream as a gift in the first place. And if you put out into the deep when he says to, he will make it fruitful but we have to do our work. So what I mean by this is that your gifts can and will emerge even if the details and the circumstances aren't what you first imagined the world to be. But the gifts do remain. And only, as our Lord tells us, the violent take the kingdom of heaven by force. How much do you want it? How, how alive do you want to become? How free do you want to become? You know, the Holy Spirit has a strategy and he's a, it's a completely spontaneous strategy because our freedom is always being enacted and he's always like redirecting and fixing it as we go along. So I love how he like strategically plans instantaneously. The enemy gets to know us and he has a strategy too, but what's our strategy? And do we put as much intelligence, hard work into our strategy as the enemy and as the Holy Spirit does? I don't know. It's a question. But... The very first step is we have to stop objecting to our dreams. If you need permission, I give it to you. If you need that permission to dream, I give you the permission here and now today. And I also say, in a gentle way, that you have an obligation to dream. And then we have to actively fight 
the obstacles that get in the way of taking the daily baby steps that we need to head toward the dreams. Okay, so we don't just need emotional permission. Maybe you already have it. You're like, someone, I don't, I don't need you to tell me I got permission. I have it. Um, but we do need emotional energy for it. I don't know anything more demanding than being a Christian. I really don't. I don't think there's anything more demanding. But what sucks our emotional energy? Well, anxiety, fear, anger, resentment, bitterness, victimhood mentality. You know, um, wherever you are, don't despair. God wills to write straight with crooked lines. Um, but those things suck up our emotional energy and get in the way of taking those steps um, toward our dreams. I began to dream again in March 2020. And what happened was right before COVID hit, um, I had, was having dinner with two friends, two new friends, they were new. And um, they didn't order wine at dinner. And I think my face was like, uh, am I gonna order wine? Am I gonna drink? Are they gonna drink? Maybe I'm not gonna drink if they're not gonna drink. And it's too long, too much, too much transparent <laughs> thinking. <laughs> and one of they're British, and one of them said, Oh, we are raging alcoholics. I was like, Oh, I'm sorry, was my face talking? Um, I was like, Oh, that's cool, yeah, you know, um, whatever. And uh, so I was like, Well, you know, awkwardness. And then, um, and they said, Oh, but we've been sober for you know 20, 25 years, 30 years. I was like, Oh, awesome, good for you. They, pr they proceed to tell me their story. And um, one of them is this man named David Clayton who wrote a book called The Vision for You about discerning personal vocation. And so he's telling me that the way that they got sober and discerned their personal vocations and began to live out their dreams was through this mentorship process and he put this mentorship process into a book in 2018. So I go home from that dinner, I'm really provoked. I'm like, this is so fascinating. You'd never know that these guys had all these struggles because they were homeless and bitter and miserable. And David was the sort of guy who like used to poke, you know, to burst Christian bubbles because he was an atheist and really smart. And um, you know, his mentor was like, look, you try this method with me and if it doesn't work, you can have your misery back with interest. And he's like, all right. <laughs> so so I'm, really, I'm really provoked by their story. So I go home, it's $4.99 on Kindle, so I buy it, I start reading it, and there's this part in the spiritual exercise that says, um, you know, what are your dreams? And I like, pause. I leave, I leave David a WhatsApp voice note, and I go, David, truth, I'm Egyptian, I'm a child of Egyptians. We're like on the survival end of things. You know, dreams, that's like, Amer that's what Americans do, you know? <laughs> You're asking a lot here, you know, and he leaves me back a voice. He's a very like typical stoic British guy. And he leaves me back a voice note and it goes, Simone, your dreams are probably so wild. You don't dare articulate them. <laughs> I was sitting there looking at my phone going, oh my gosh, they are so wild. I don't even know what they are. <laughs> Anyway, this leads me to a whole long path of, you know, being mentored by David. Here are the ways in which he helped me tackle those obstacles that drained my emotional energy. They got in the way of the emotional permission to dream and dream big with the Lord. It's called the daily routine. Let me check my watch. Do I have time? What time did I start? Okay. Um, here are some of the practicals. And this will sound very familiar because there's a lot of other processes that adopt these very similar spiritual exercises. But I begin in my end, I end my day on my knees saying, God, I begin the day saying, God, um, I'm your child. Take care of me today. Please help me to follow your will and bring you glory. I never want to get on my knees in the morning, ever, you know, ever. I'm like, Lord, you know, I mean it in my heart of hearts, but no, I do it. And I get down on my knees. And then at the end of the day, I get down on my knees and I thank him for taking care of me. And David says, it's good manners to thank God for taking care of you at the end of the day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then here are the, here are the tools to fight, for, to fight anxiety. Every time I have an anxious moment throughout the day, I stop and say the serenity prayer. 
God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Every time I'm annoyed at someone, which is a lot, because um, there's nothing that sucks your energy more like anger, resentment, bitterness, you know, I'll stop and I'll say, God, I wish everything um, for that DMV employee that I wish for myself, right? I, I wish everything for that coworker that I wish for myself. I, and say it until it no longer has that hold on me. I think St. Thomas, St. Thomas is day. I mean, when St. Thomas says that to love is to will the good of the other, that's what I'm doing when I'm annoyed at someone. I'm willing their good. I wish for them all the good things that I wish for myself. I never want to will the person's good when I'm annoyed at them, but I, I will tell you what motivates me. I love making the devil mad. And how annoying it must be to him that precisely in the minute he wants to rob me of my peace and bitterness and my pride and my I know things, I'm going to do things better, right? Here I am willing the good of the person who is the source of my agitation. That's a pretty powerful tool. And then I do a daily gratitude list. There's so much more that I want to say about this daily routine, but sister's right. Find a friend, find a mentor, find a coach, find a therapist, find a spiritual director, you know, find them all, have them all. Because we need each other to continue on this path of keeping our dreams alive because our friends care about our destiny and they care about our dreams more than we do for ourselves. That is just a fact. Pope Benedict XVI said, no one lives alone, no one sins alone, and no one's saved alone. And when Jesus sent his disciples out, he sends them out two by two. We, and we can't, we can't do it without that. We, can, we cannot fight the darkness alone. And this is our third category, the darkness. And I love that Sister just set this up. Inevitably, our missions, in our missions, we've either come from darkness or we're on our way to darkness. The core of the Christian narrative is Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter Sunday. This is, this is the most dramatic, traumatic three days in Jesus' life. It is also the pattern and cycle that our lives take. This is something that, I don't know how many of you follow Dan Allender or Kathy Lorzell, but something that they talk, Anatomy on, that they talk about this well and a lot. This is from them. And that ta- that's the cycle our lives take. Good Friday, Holy Saturday, Easter Sunday. And it is particularly in the times of darkness, in Holy Saturday, that we need to exercise the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which have been given to us in the form of the charisms. What are charisms? I'm sure, a lot, I'm sure most of you know what charisms are. How many of you know what charisms are? Okay, so you know what charisms are. But real quick for those who don't. Charisms are not those traditional gifts of the Holy Spirit that we're familiar with, that we receive in the sacraments, wisdom, understanding, fortitude, counsel, piety, fear of the Lord. It's not that. That's for our sanctification. The charisms that St. Paul talks about in the book of Corinthians are gifts that are given to us for the purpose of building up the kingdom of God. When we are in darkness, we need people around us who are exercising their charisms, helping us go through and get out of the darkness. We need each other in this way. We need to exercise our charisms. And a shout out to Katie Dawson, wherever you are in this room, I can't see you. Because if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have known what the charisms were because she invited, there she is. Because 20 years ago, she invited me to a charisms discernment workshop at a parish and I went and it completely changed my life. I discovered at that workshop that one of my charisms, one of my gifts is the charism of evangelization. I didn't know there was a charism of that. Um, Again, weird things are just happening. Life is weird, right? And I just, I didn't know there was like actual categories for things. And what was happening to me was I was in my, um, I was in the secular world, I was in marketing um, and all my business trips and meetings with people, they just kept talking to me about God. You know, I would be on the plane or a train or a bus or, and you know, 
inevitably the person next to me would turn to me and be like, I'm a bitter ex-Catholic. What do you have to say about that? <laughs> How do you know that I would love to talk to you about this? My mom's like, oh, you're probably dangling your rosary in front of him. I'm like, no, I wasn't. I wasn't. Um, and, at a, and then one time I was getting my nails done and on a business trip, and the woman next to me was like, I don't think anybody in this world cares and loves me, and then like left the nail salon. I was like, no, wait. Um, so then I decided that strategy. I'm going to have prayer cards printed of the St. Ambrose prayer card. And if you've heard me speak before, you know that I always bring up this prayer because it was so fundamental in changing my life. So this prayer is, teach me, O Lord, to search for you. Show yourself to me when I search for you. If you don't teach me first, I can't seek you. If you don't reveal yourself to me, I cannot find you. In longing, may I search for you. And in searching, long for you. In love, may I find you. And in finding you, may I love you. I thought, okay, this is like... Right, I'm your problem, you teach me. So it set me free. I was like, I'm sorry God, you get to fix my life. Um, so I thought, you know what, that's a great prayer to give to anybody. And they could be, an atheist could pray it. You know, if you're out there God, if you're real, teach me, okay. So I had them printed up at like 300, because you have to order 300 business cards, I'm on business cards. And in the course of like four years, I had literally given out all the cards. So <laughs> I'm at this charism as a sermon workshop and they're like, are you the sort of person that people just talk to you about? Right? The point is, is that either you're in this room and you already know what your charisms are, or there are charisms that have yet to be discovered. My only advice besides like actually doing a charism as a sermon thing is to like, just look at the weird things that are happening in your life. Because I just, I was like, isn't that weird that keeps happening? Isn't that just so weird? But the way... <laughs> But if you can recognize the weirdness, you can recognize the gift, okay? And, and that's what happened to me. And then when I went to study theology, um, I didn't go to, to like enter into church work. I literally like went to learn. And then I was going to go back to marketing. It was just like a two-year break. My parents were thrilled that I was going to blow my savings on a, you know, really lucrative degree like theology. Um, <laughs> But, and then of course my life took a different route because a priest friend called and said, hey, do you need a job? I'm like, yeah, I, I don't have one. And uh, I have this degree, I, you know, what am I gonna do? Um, and he's like, well, I just got made pastor and um, it need, the church needs revival. Do you wanna come revive it with me? I'm like, yes, what's the name of the church? He said, oh, it's St. It's Ambrose. Now, you'd think I would have put that together, <laughs> but I didn't. My friend Beth was like, isn't it amazing? How you, and I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> we really need friends. OK, so <laughs> there's one gift that I want to encourage you to recognize and cultivate. Um, and this isn't my idea. This is St. Paul's. This is what St. Paul says. He says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, but especially the gift of prophecy. Why prophecy above all the other gifts? This is what St. Paul says. Everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. He who prophesies edifies the church. So what is prophecy? Prophecy is what Sister was saying in the first talk, where you are speaking the word into someone's life and by speaking it, changing them, changing their vision and letting them begin again. So prophecy isn't about predicting the future, but about seeing someone as God sees them. And to quote my friend, John Schuster, in the fullness of their identity, purpose and calling, it's about tapping into God's heart for a person, place or situation, listening for what he has to say about them and declaring it over them. Here's what Pope Benedict says, prophecy in the biblical sense does not mean to predict the future, but to explain the will of God for the present and therefore show the right path to take for the future. So when we're in darkness, when we're in our holy, holy Saturday seasons, right, we're out of the crisis of the trauma of Good Friday in our lives. 
Because when we're in those moments, we know like we can barely pray, right? It's just we're there hanging on. And when we're in Easter Sunday, it's great. I love those superficial prayers. Thanks, God. See you later. We'll talk more later. We'll talk more soon. Um, but in Holy Saturday, that's when things get super real. So when we're in that dead zone, in that dead end, when there's no signs of life, when there's no physical evidence, when there's no spiritual sense that anything in life is going to change, that's when we need our friends and our sisters to cast a prophetic vision on our life. Because there's nothing, as sister said, there's nothing the enemy wants more and has strategically and cleverly planned for than when you are in your darkness and you can't hear God's voice for you to give up. And what's more powerful than having a friend or being that friend who speaks God's goodness and truth and encouragement into your life when you are at the breaking point? This is what prophets do. They remind us of God when we're in exile. They dream with us. My friend Jonna that I just quoted was with me yesterday. We spent seven hours together dreaming together. They remind us not to skip ahead from Good Friday to Easter Sunday. This is something that Kathy Lorizel, who's a Christian therapist, talks about. She created this U diagram and she says, that the narrative is like a U. There's Good Friday in one point. There's Easter Sunday in the other point. To heal, to go from Good Friday to Easter Sunday, we need to dip down into the bottom of the U, dip down into Holy Saturday to get out of it. That's how we heal authentically. But that's precisely the time when we want to check out because it's very painful to feel those emotions. And the temptation of the Christian is to, she says, create a dotted line that wants to just like skip over from Good Friday to Easter Sunday. But there's no way, there's no way. We have to go through the desert. The Israelites weren't spared of the wandering in the wilderness, and neither are we. So prophets don't just speak hard truths. They paint a vision for us to keep us on the path and to keep us on the game, in the game. And they remind us that our wounds become our greatest weapons and therefore our greatest gifts. And if our greatest gifts, then the condition for our greatest glory. The problems then, so our problems, become clues then for our callings. And this is an insight that I I really internalized from the Desert Fathers. I can't remember which one it was. But I remember when I read this, um, it almost instantaneously took me out of this darkness that I was going through in my life. He said that that which is afflicting you is the very thing. Oh, he says, the one who is afflicting you is your benefactor. That which is afflicting you is the very thing God is trying to heal in you. I'll say it again. The one who is afflicting you is your benefactor. That which is afflicting you is the very thing that God is trying to heal in you. St. Paul says it like this, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. The darkness, it's a gift if we use it well. And the way we can use it well is if we do as St. Paul says, which is to recognize and cultivate the gift of prophecy for the sake of the church, and if for the church, then also for the world. Because it will be prophets. It will be each other. This is why Paul says, strive eagerly for all the gifts, but especially that you may prophecy, because there will come that breaking point. There will come that Holy Saturday. There will come that moment when there is no indication that anything will change that will feel as the Israelites felt when the Lord spoke to them in the book of Jeremiah, you have an incurable wound. You have been cast out. I will not heal you. Of course, God does heal us because he says later in verse 17, but I'm going to heal you, right? But (laughs) it's like, thanks God. You just said in verse 13, you have an incurable wound. Um, But that's because it's in a way God's saying, I know how you feel, 
There is nothing to give you any sense that you're going to get out of this, but you will. So isn't that the point of it all? And that's, our, that's the point of us. We're the laity, right? Our job, our primary job, is to restore the temporal order, to bring Christ, the light of nations, to this extremely dark world. So let me speak prophetically to you here and now by paraphrasing the Bible, okay? You are the salt of the earth. You are the city set on a mountain that cannot be hidden. It can't. You are the lamp that was lit and that can't be put under a bushel basket. You are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. My ladies, you have a unique corner of the kingdom that you are called to take back from the enemy. He has taken it. He has robbed it. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. It is time to take it back. Are you going to take back that which is yours to take back? So recognize your gifts, recognize your call, call, and go get it. Thanks.